Welcome to The Great Exchange, a podcast about examining the lies that we believe and exchanging them for God's truth. I'm your host, Brady Cohn. Today's podcast is going to look a little different than normal. A while back, I had the opportunity to tour around to several cities with Josh McDowell and speak alongside him at some conferences. Josh is one of the world's most renowned and popular apologists. He's written over 150 books and his knowledge is absolutely remarkable. Josh spoke about the reliability of scripture and how because of God's word is so reliable, we can trust every word of it. And then I spoke after him to share about how because of the reliability of God's word, I could surrender all of my life to God, including my sexuality. So what follows is my testimony from those events. And at the end is some Q&A time where Josh and I together are able to answer some of the questions that, that the audience had. I really pray that today is edifying for you, that it's encouraging, and that as you go throughout your week, you can examine the lies that you believe and exchange them for God's truth. Thanks for joining us today, and please enjoy. Thank you, everyone. So grateful to be here. And uh, I, I came on this trip alone from Washington, but joining me on Zoom is my wife and our little girl and her grandparents. And so everyone say hi to my wife, Mary, because she loves attention. So they're all saying hi, and Rowan there is waving. So, uh, so they are going to join us. My wife wanted to make sure that uh, they didn't all miss one of their favorite people, which is Josh McDowell. But uh, they're, 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 they're stuck with me for tonight. So they're going to sit over there and join us. But since my family couldn't come with me, I did bring a couple of family pictures. And so this first one was our Christmas picture. We have a little farm in Washington. So we have our sheep and our little donkeys and some chickens and, of course, Tuxedo the cat. Uh, sitting on my lap, and so we love our little uh, farm that we have going on there. The next picture is Rowan with one of our little donkeys. That was just a couple weeks ago. His name is Jerry, because they're all named after Seinfeld characters. So, so that's Jerry. The next picture, I just couldn't help myself, because she's. I took that right before I left, and uh, she is precious. So we live on this little farm in Washington, but my story actually begins on another farm. I remember growing up on a farm in Nebraska. And growing up on the farm, I always remember feeling different than the rest of the boys. I always remember looking at my dad and my brother and thinking, there's something about them that is different than me. Uh, there's, I, I don't quite fit in with them. I feel kind of excluded from this world of manhood and whatever that is. And it wouldn't be until years later when I'd figure out what that difference was. In the meantime, I grew up going to church. We're a church-going family. We went to church on Sundays. We prayed before our meals. We did all those things that good church-going families were supposed to do. But my life got a little bit messy when I was about 11 years old, and my parents got a divorce. And many of you guys have dealt with those situations. You know how hard that can be for a family. My family's life was kind of chaotic for a few years. It was also during the beginning of that time I started to really struggle going into junior high age. You know, junior high is a horrible time for everyone, right? It's like, it's, it's really awkward and confusing. And you're going through all these changes and I, I, all the boys my age were starting to notice girls in ways that uh, they had never noticed girls before. All of a sudden, girls went from having cooties to being kind of cute. There's that type of transformation happening. But I wasn't feeling those feelings for girls, but I was starting to feel those feelings for other boys. And I didn't know why I was having those feelings. I was really confused by that. And I had enough church background to know that homosexuality is a sin. But I had always heard it preached from, from some very kind of self-righteous preaching that always made it sound like it's the one unforgivable sin. So just the fact that I was dealing with these feelings and dealing with these attractions consumed me with shame and guilt. Well, I did a really good job of keeping it a secret for a couple of years because I didn't think I, could have, I had anyone to talk to. My family life was kind of a mess. And my family had really walked away from Christianity because it had been so much about image. And now the image is over, right? Uh, the image is blown, so we might as well walk away. But I kept going to youth group on Wednesday nights because deep down, I really wanted to know who God was. Well, when I was 13, I decided that I've got to tell someone. I've got to tell someone what's going on inside of me. And maybe a youth leader, maybe one of the youth pastors will have an answer for this. So I decided I should tell one of them. 
But one night at youth group, before I got the courage to do that, was a moment that forever will change my life. I'll never forget sitting there as a hurting, confused 13-year-old when the youth pastor made the comment from the pulpit. He said, I wish all homosexuals would die. And that moment just felt like a knife to my chest. I'll never forget sitting there uh, just and thinking, that's me. That's me who he's talking about. So I went home that night and I loaded a gun and I was going to end my life. Because I thought, if it's God's will for all homosexuals to die like I heard a youth group, then I guess I will. So thankfully, by the grace of God, right before I pushed the trigger on the gun, I heard my mom walk in the front door. So I kind of came to my senses and hurried and put the gun underneath my bed before she saw anything. So obviously, I didn't end my life that night. But that was just the start of a downward spiral in my life. That was the moment I put up a wall around myself. And I said, I guess I just can't let anyone in. I guess I have to put on an image for everyone. I guess I have to hide this. And it would be years until I would step inside the doors of a church again. So going through the rest of high school was like a pendulum of emotions swinging back and forth. It was shortly after that youth group incident that I discovered online pornography, which 20 years ago was uh, pretty new in our culture. But now, obviously, it's rampant everywhere, and so many men and women consumed with addiction to it. But my addiction to pornography was more than just a sexual addiction. When I discovered this pornography, I discovered a place where these people seem to have the same feelings as me. They have the same desires as me. I desperately want to belong somewhere. I want to be understood. And it felt like the only place where I could belong was in this online world of darkness. And so as my pornography addiction grew, uh, like many sexual addictions do, over time, uh, what you're seeing on the screen is not enough and you need to start acting on it. So I started experimenting with same-sex encounters and relationships and pursuing the LGBTQ community. And one of the things I experienced as a child, which I always hate to say this at church, but it's true, but at that time, I, my experience was that the LGBT community was much more loving than the Christian community. And so I was desperate to have that community where I could feel loved and understood. But I was still wrestling with God on this pendulum swing back and forth. On one side, I'd say, all right, God, uh, I don't believe that you can love me the way that I am. I don't believe that you can love me when I'm living this life. So I have to fix myself. Where do you love me? And so I would do that. I would try to do that anyway. I'd walk away from it. And as any of you who have ever struggled with sexual addiction and have ever said, I'm just never going to do that again, uh, what you know happens is about 42 minutes later, you do it again, right? And then you're hopeless. Your hopes are dashed, and you say, I just can't do it. I guess this is who I am. And so that's where I was when I graduated from high school, is I had just accepted that I'm gay, and that's who I have to be. Our society was talking about these issues a lot more, and what they were saying was that if you are attracted to the same gender, then you're gay, and you need to accept that as your identity and your lifestyle to have fulfillment and happiness. And so it made sense to me. It felt like I was just born this way. So I guess that's just the way I am. Well, I went on to college at a small college in Nebraska called Shattern State College. And I'll never forget pulling up to campus for the first time to move into the dorms. And I pulled up, there's this group of guys standing there who offered to help me unload my things, which I, I thought was the most amazing thing ever. It turns out it was the typical church college uh, freshman move in outreach, but I was so grateful that these guys helped me move in. And so then they invited me to a ministry on campus that met on Wednesday nights. So I went to this ministry the first Wednesday night, not because I was walking with God, not because uh, I, I knew the Lord as my Savior. I was hard hearted and bitter and angry, but I was also kind of a loner and I really wanted to make some friends. And I thought maybe this would be a good place to do that. Well, I faithfully showed up every Wednesday night for two years. And I'm sure that the gospel was preached, but nothing I heard from the pulpit really changed my life. But what did change my life were some of the relationships that were built there. These upperclassmen men who started to pursue me, who started to love me, who started to include me in their community that I so desperately wanted to belong to. And these guys would ask me spiritual questions. They would uh, try to probe and, you know, uh, find out what's going on in my heart. And I had enough Sunday school background to give them the answers that I thought they wanted to hear. Uh, but they knew that something was wrong, but they continued to love me and pursue me and try to dig a little bit deeper into my life. 
So I didn't realize during this time that how God was using them to soften my heart. God was using them to show me a different picture of Christianity. It wasn't just this Christianity where they showed up at church on Sundays and put on a mask and pretended like their life was okay. This was a Christianity where they so deeply loved Jesus. They loved people. They were authentic and real and open about their own sin and their struggles. But they weren't just authentic for the sake of authenticity. They were authentic for the sake of repentance. And because of that, I could see Jesus working in their lives and changing them from the inside out. Well, things came to kind of a breaking point after my sophomore year. I ended a same-sex relationship and was really, really hurt and left broken and hurting and confused. And I remember thinking during these times, after every relationship, after every sexual encounter, after having the things that the world w said would make me happy, I remember them not make me happy. I remember walking away from them saying, this isn't doing for me what it promised to do for me. This isn't doing for my soul what it promised to do for my soul, because I finally had it, but the more I had of it, the more that I needed. And it was leaving me feeling hurt and broken and so unloved. Well, I decided in the state of hopelessness, that one of my only options was to end my life. But I said, before I end my life, I want to tell one of my Christian friends about this life I was living. And it's going to be affirmation that they don't actually love me. It's going to be affirmation that they only love the person they think I am. They only love the image I portray to them. Once they find out what's actually going on inside, there's no way that they'll actually love me. So I wrote out a whole letter, and I, I read it to my friend Lex. And I'll never forget sitting there with him. I, we were in my stepdad's house, and I actually had a gun loaded in my room and said, when he rejects me, that's going to be the end of my life. Well, I'm standing here today, so obviously Lex didn't reject me. Instead, he, he, I'll never forget, I poured out my heart to him. He came across the room, gave me this big hug, said, hey, man, I love you. And it's going to be okay because God's grace is sufficient, and your sin is no better or worse than my sin, and we're going to get through this together. And that just, that just blew my mind. That just blew my mind that a Christian of all people could love me so well. And what I couldn't get out of my mind for the next three days was that that can't be Lex who loves me. That has to be the Jesus I see in him who loves me. Because for two years, I'd been seeing Jesus change his life from the inside out. And so because of this conviction for the first time that I think that Jesus loves me, despite my sin, despite all the stuff I've been doing and the way I've been living, I think that Jesus still loves me. And so because of that, on June 21st, 2006, I fell to my knees in repentance towards Christ. And you know, I had always called myself a Christian. I'd always done so many of the Christian things. I had the label, I checked the boxes. Uh, but what I realized in this moment was that my faith had been my demands on God. It had been my terms and conditions. It had been me telling God, all right, God, I'll follow you, but I expect that you instantly make me attracted to women, take this struggle away, give me a wife, a house, the whole American dream. And so my faith was nothing more than my demands on God. But finally, God brought me to a place of surrender where I said, I don't care what it takes. I don't care what I have to do. I don't care who I have to tell. I don't care what it costs me. I trust that you love me, and that love is enough. Therefore, I surrender my life to you. And that was the moment that the Holy Spirit entered into my life, and I came to know Christ. Well, my life instantly started to change. I, I told the rest of my Christian friends, and I, I thought I'd done a really good job keeping it a secret. It turns out they knew a lot more than I thought that they did. But, uh, but I told them, and for the first time, I had community where I could pour out my heart and be real. And they, these guys knew nothing about homosexuality. But what they did know was that God's word has the answers for everything in life. So they started to read with me and pray with me and read scripture with me. And that summer, I started to fall in love with Jesus and, and his word and, and the hope that I found in it. Many times, uh, we see these sins as just so messy and so foreign. One time, I was speaking at a church, and a lady came up to me afterwards. She said, I know I should reach out to my lesbian neighbors, but that sin is just too yucky for me. And I, I had two responses for her. I, said, first of all, go home and look yourself in the mirror and understand that Jesus had to hang on the cross just as long for your sin as he did for your lesbian neighbor. And I said, secondly, go to Acts 17. And we see where Paul goes to Athens and he sees a city that's so full of idolatry that he's physically sickened by it. And that included sexual sin and homosexuality. But he didn't say, that's too yucky for me. He went there and he lived with them. So he says this so he could understand the idols that their hearts were serving and proclaim Jesus to them. 
So that's what these men did in my life. They were the Paul who uh, knew that their discomfort was worth it for the sake of the gospel. That they could enter into the messiness of my life and understand the idols I was serving so they could proclaim the truth of the gospel in my life and give me hope. So that summer, my life was completely changing. And, but the problem was I still had this struggle. I still had this, this, uh, the, these feelings, these attractions, these temptations. So what do I do with that? Uh, I tried over and over again to make them go away, and they didn't. But I finally, for the first time, I had hoped that I could live a different life because I found 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And these first two verses, verses 9 and 10, I feel like I'd always heard growing up. Uh, verses 9 and 10 uh, say, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor the thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that's some very serious scripture right there. But for some reason, I'd always heard those two verses pointed out towards the homosexual community, even though it probably covers all of us on a daily basis. But my life started to change that summer when someone pointed out the very next verse, verse 11. It says, and such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And that gave me hope. My mind was blown that 2,000 years ago, there's people who were homosexuals, but they're no longer that. Because this is not a new issue. This has been going on ever since Genesis 3. And Christ has been entering people's lives and changing them for eternity. And so by the end of the summer, I was living a completely different life. But I want to be very clear about the transformation that happened in my life that summer. God didn't uh, step into my life and flip a switch and take me from gay to straight which I feel like is so many times is the church's goal for people like me. You know, the transformation God did in my life that summer is he stepped into my life and he transformed me from lost to saved. And that is so much more remarkable than any type of just external behavior change. He stepped inside my soul and he saved me for eternity. And it was out of that hope that I started to change how I lived. We live in a world that lies to us about so many things, and one of those is sexuality. Our world tells us that our humanity is found in expressing our feelings. Our humanity is found by living out whatever is going on inside of us, regardless of where it comes from. But Christ comes along and says our humanity is in him because he made us in God's image. So we are more human when we surrender to him and the person he wants us to be. I discovered that summer that I could surrender all areas of my life to God's word because it was all reliable and trustworthy. I, I discovered resources and books like the book More Than a Carpenter. Ever, ever heard of that one? And I read it that summer and it's like, this, every word of this book is true. So I can't pick and choose what I believe. I need to surrender my life to all of it. So that summer I surrendered my sexuality to Christ too. And I walked away from the homosexual lifestyle. God gave me value. He showed me that uh, as part of this transformation that I have value because I am his child made in his image. He, he gave me uh, a power. He showed me that now that I'm a believer, I have the power of the Holy Spirit in me to deny myself, which is not a, a power that a non-believer has. And lastly, he gave me a new identity. He showed me that I'm not defined by my struggles. I'm not defined by my feelings. I'm not defined by the labels that, that society gives me or that sometimes even the church gives me. But my identity is in him, only him. And over time, my identity in, my, uh, in Jesus started to outweigh my identity in my sexuality. And I was living a different life. Romans 1 talks about homosexuality, and it's this progression. They traded God's truth for a lie. And they, because of that, they worship creation instead of the creator. They worshiped images of God, which it's interesting that people are made in the image of God. So they're worshiping each other as images of God instead of worshiping God himself. And that led to lust for one another. And because of that lust for people of the same gender, God gave them over to that lust, and they had sexual relations with one another. And they suffered uh, because, of their, because of their sin. But God, through his grace, took me down a reverse course of that, where through the power of the Holy Spirit, he helped me get control over how I was living, showed me that I can deny myself on a daily basis regardless of the feelings that I have. And he, then he started, through this process of sanctification, started to reveal some of the lies that I had believed that had led me to that place. And through his grace over these last 15 years, continues to reveal those lies and exchange them for his truth. 
I now have a life that I never imagined that I would live. Freedom, not necessarily always freedom from temptation and desire. I sometimes have to go to the Lord and have to repent and check my heart and still process what lies am I believing. But I live a life of freedom I never imagined I could have. I have a beautiful wife at home and a beautiful little girl. And whenever... uh, Though I I talk about my marriage, I always want to make it clear to Christians that me being married to a woman does not heal me. It is not a sign that I've been healed. It should not be the goal for a same-sex attracted person because our redemption does not come from from marriage. Excuse me. Our redemption can only come from Christ. And so it's through redemption in Christ that I can be married and surrender my life to loving another person unconditionally because I have everything I need in Christ. And that is a beautiful picture of marriage that God has for us. One time uh, when I was dating Mary, uh, Christians kept asking me really interesting questions. They'd, they'd ask, oh, you're dating a woman, so you're attracted to women now. And I just cringe at that. And I'd say, no, no, no. I don't want to trade my lust for men for lust for women. I want to be attracted to one woman, and that's my wife. And God, through his grace, through now five years of dating, engagement, and, and marriage, has built that desire and attraction in, for her in ways that the world says impossible for someone like me. But that's what happens when our lives are surrendered to the gospel. Uh, he does them what the world says is impossible. With that said, let me close this in prayer. And Josh and Aaron and I believe Nate are going to join us on stage and lead us in some Q&A time. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this time. I thank you for these people. I thank you that they came to learn and to grow. And I pray that tonight they are equipped to do just that. I pray that they are equipped to step into the lives of their neighbors and their friends and uh, their, their coworkers and understand the idols that they're serving, understand the lies that they have believed and exchange them for your truth. We pray these things in your name, amen. As these gentlemen are stepping up here, Thank you. I would love to invite you to check out my table in the back. There's some information on the podcast I do where every week we talk about marriage, sexuality, culture, the church. I'd love to check that out. Check out my website. Uh, There's some encouraging videos, and I'd love to be a resource for you any way that I can. Man, what a wonderful testimony. Josh, thank you so much as well for just... I sat over there and got saved all over again. (laughs) Amen. Amen. The gospel is good. Amen. Amen. God is so kind. We are so thankful. Both of these guys, can we just have a real quick another hand, round of applause to these guys just being here and serving us and, and preaching the gospel to us again. Thank you guys so, so much. Man, what a wonderful privilege. Yeah, Brady, thank you guys. So we have just a little bit of time. We're going to do a Q&A. We've got some questions that came in. Uh, so we're just going to get right into it, all right? And so our first question here, Josh, I'm going to throw this one to you. Of course. Reads, How do we know that the canon of scripture, our Bible, is accurate? Would you answer that for us? When they determine the canon, which means read, um, to measure something by a read, um, to become part of the canon, biblical canon, there was about 11 or 12 issues that had to be dealt with. For example, was it written by a very notable famous person like uh, a prophet, uh, an apostle, uh, and it had to be someone who lived at the time of Christ within one year generation after that. Uh, So he had to be a witness of the person of Christ and what happened. And then they had it that all the material within the context and new material ever added had to be consistent with what already had been revealed. And that caused a lot of material to be uh, rejected. But there were 11, 12 different things like that they went through to be a part of the canon. And um, the thing is, the canon, as we have it today, was accepted by the New Testament church. And that's very critical. In fact, there were a number of canons down through the years And almost every one of them contained the books in the biblical canon uh, because there was a witness that they were authentic. Also, each book in the canon had to show that it had a a personal dynamic to change lives. That was very critical. And so they went through a lot of tests to make sure the canon was biblical. 
and uh, it stood to this day. To this wow. day. Amen. Well, what a wonderful thing, man, to, to be able to trust the word of God that we have yeah. uh, in our hands and the translations that we do. I mean, and another thing too, what a blessing it is, right? Yeah. But in evidence that demands a verdict book, I have a whole section on that. that could be very helpful to you. Uh, and I think if you read that section, 50% of what you read will be new to you that you hadn't heard before. And uh, that's why I documented it all. So you wouldn't have to trust me. You could go back to the original sources. Wow. Thank you so much, Josh, for that. That's, that's wonderful. And yeah, again, picking up some of his books would be such a tremendous blessing for all of us, I think, to gain clarity and, and uh, apologetics for our own hearts, right? Ask um, him a question. Yeah. We're, next up, Brady, you're it. All right. Here we go. All right. So the next <laughs> question that we me. have, uh, this one says, can you specifically speak to the born this way thought process and train of thinking? Okay, big question. It's, uh, I hope you've had a lot of coffee because we might be here for a while. Uh, so You got the, four minutes. Four minutes, all right. Uh, so my wife had to tell me that sometimes too. So uh, I understand. Yes. And so that is such a big argument in our culture, the LGBTQ community saying, well, I'm just bored in this way. And so my answer to that is, for one thing, I don't believe, believe that because I've seen God change my heart along with thousands of other people and reveal the lies that I had believed that led me to that place. But when I'm ministering to someone, especially a non-believer, I say that the, that doesn't really matter because none of us were born right the first time, and that's why we have to be born again. And so... Uh, and so that's, it, for the sake of evangelism, it doesn't matter. I, it does matter for the sake of discipleship, because when someone's a believer, we want to uh, allow the Lord to untwist what their heart had twisted. And so that's where I believe that the Holy Spirit can reveal those things and peel back layers of the onion and uh, bring someone transformation. But I don't argue with a non-believer about that, because they don't have the Holy Spirit to reveal deep layers of their heart. And so if they believe that they're born that way, then... Uh, then um, I'm not going to argue with them on that. Wow. What, what clarity, man. Could Thank I follow you so that up much. with a couple of questions? Absolutely. Absolutely. What, what is one of the worst things someone could say to a gay person? Uh, great question. Um, I would say one of the worst things you can say is oversimplifying it by saying that it's a choice. And sometimes we have this false dichotomy where it's like, well, if they're not born that way, then they chose it. But it doesn't have to be either or. It's like most of us didn't choose the specific sin issues we struggle with. We may have made choices along the way that cemented them into our heart and made it worse. But I remember struggling with desire for men emotionally when I was six years old after being really hurt and wounded. And I didn't wake up as a six-year-old boy and say, I'm going to be really hurt today by men. And I'm going to compensate for that hurt by this emotional infatuation with them that's going to turn sexual when I'm 11. Like no one wakes up and makes that choice. And so we have to be very careful to uh, not make assumptions and, uh, and do much more listening than we do speaking. Well, the second question, and what is one of the most encouraging things you could say to a gay person? Say you're loved. If, if they make these disclosures and open up about their life, tell them about how incredibly loved that they are, not only by Christ, but by, but by you. And one of the things I say is when they're talking about their struggles is me too for anyone, because whatever they're idolizing, we've idolized things too. We've all turned to people for our hope and to find our wholeness and find our value instead of Christ. So as they're, uh, as we're engaging with them, uh, all no ground is level on the foot of the cross. And so communicate that they are loved because they have not always experienced that from Christians. I was in Washington, D.C., and there was a gay man from Connecticut that was there that I'd met before. And I saw him at a distance about from here to those tables. And I rushed up to him, threw my arms around him, gave him a big hug and a kiss on the neck. And he backed away and started to cry. Mm -hmm. And I went, Phew. I said, what did I do? I said, are you okay? He said, he said, thank you. Thank you. I said, what do you mean? He said, the moment somebody knows I'm gay, they back away from you. Mm. And he said, it makes you feel so dirty. And he said, and you just ran right up to me and gave me a big hug. Whew. Wow, that's I never powerful. Knew that. it, it, Absolutely. It, I just can't, I can't comprehend what a gay person would go through in the American culture and most cultures around the world. Mm -hmm. One thing I did with my children, 
There was, his name was Jade. I couldn't remember his name the other day. Jade was a gay waiter at a corner restaurant in Laguna Beach, kind of in the gay area. But it was a breakfast. Wherever my wife and I was in Laguna Beach, we always had breakfast there. And everyone was gay in there but her and me. And Jade was one of the waiters, became a dear friend of ours. And um, I said, Jay, I had two of my children with me because the others were too young. I said, do you have about 10, 15 minutes you could take a break and come over here? He said, yes, give me a few minutes. And he came over and I said, Jay, and this is one of the best things I ever did. I said, would you share with my children what is it like being gay in America? What are your fears, your, your anxieties and everything? I gotta tell you, it's the best thing I ever did for my children. My children gravitates towards gays, homosexuals. I want my children to raise up to love them because Christ loves every gay person. I've never met a gay person Jesus didn't die for. I never met a gay person God doesn't love as much as he loves me. And so my gosh, I gotta raise my children. Uh, to love gays Absolutely. and not just to have an opportunity to witness to them, but to love them as a human being created in the image of God, with infinite value, dignity, and worth. And uh, that was one of the more honoring to God things I ever did with my children. And That's then amazing. I invited a gay person to come home with me and have dinner with my family mm. and at the table. And I told him ahead of time, it's okay if I ask you to do this. I said, would you share what is it like being gay in America? Your fears and all. Boy, I got an eye opener. Mm. I learned so much. And the biggest thing, I learned how much I was ignorant about mm. and wrong things that I was saying. And I would encourage all of you to think that through and do it with your children and your grandkids.